What we want to do is reconstruct all of our tasks into no time element. Go pick the beans, and when you're done, we'll read a story. Okay? That way the child can make their own decision on how long it's going to take me to pick these beans. I can either do it fast and fool around, or I can get it done and get my whatever the reward is. Okay? That teaches efficiency. It teaches creativity. How can I do it faster? Can I move the bucket with me faster? All those little nuances okay, happen when we, when we take the time element um, out of it. We do this even in our whole farm business now where we, don't, we never pay anybody by the hour. We have 20 people on staff and nobody works hourly because we think hourly encourages people to, to dawdle. Uh, and so we want, we want project oriented. And so um, some of you are probably familiar with, um, you know, Dave Ramsey's uh, monetary solutions. We, we think this is part of the snowball. Uh, it, it's part of a, a completion oriented snowball mentality that, um, that where, where I only get uh, rewarded, compensated, or satisfied when I'm done. That's a whole different deal then, well, I put in my time today, or I put in my time, you know, for the, for the requirement. So, uh, so uh, a task-oriented uh, and, and uh, a little bit of competitive, competitive creativity in the workplace and, and making sure that all the projects are clearly delineated and it's only a, a performance base. Uh, uh, that teaches that work has a, you know, has a, has a fulfillment, an end, a satiation, a point, and, um, and, 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 a, and, and a joy to it. Um, you know, you can turn anything into a story. I, um, I remember well growing up, we had all these thistles, and uh, Dad would go to work, and he had a chalkboard downstairs. He would write the, you know, projects for the day that my brother and I had to do. And in the summer, uh, when we were off from school, one of the projects was every single day we had to chop thistles for one hour. And uh, so we'd go out there with a thistle hose and we'd chop, chop thistles. Now, you could have been really bummed about chopping thistles all day. You know what I did? My brother still, you know, rubs me about this all the time because he's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. And so what I did, you know, so we're like, he's three years older. So he's like 13, I'm 10, right? We're out there with our thistle hose and we're out. Doing it. And so I decided to turn this into a great, big, wonderful story. So I'm, I'm here narrating for an hour, you know, and of course he's plugging his ears. I, here's the Salatin brothers surrounding the thistle nation on the right flank. You know, I'm a, I'm a military history buff too, you know. So, so I'm, I'm talking about how we're how we're, you know, uh, moving around the right flank of the Thistle Nation, and oh, we've got them on the run, you know. Oh, there's a, you know, they're trying to get away over there. And I'm, I'm just rattling on, telling this story the whole time. You know, listen, I've been talking a long time, right? I mean, you know, I had to go to speech therapy at four years old because I wasn't talking yet. Mom and Dad were concerned I had a real problem. And so the family joke is, you know, he didn't start till he was four, but he hadn't quit, you know, once he started. So, so, but all of this, all of this work can be turned into into a fun narrative like that, okay? Number three, give the kids freedom. Give the kids freedom to explore, to experiment. I mean, our world is full of, of, uh, of farms with 40-year-old men on them that still can't use a two-by-four unless they ask Dad if they can. And that's a shame, okay? So, um, you know, if, if, if kids are incorporated, if they're integrated, and if they're learning to love to work, they're going to enjoy um, uh, you know, being in the shop. They're going to learn the tools. They're going to learn some, give them some rain. Let them use a scrap board. Let them, let them build something. It, it doesn't matter if it's something you want. It doesn't matter if it's something that's silly. Give them freedom to experiment, to explore. And yes, those nails that a four-year-old bends over trying to pound into that two-by-four over there. That's how they pound them straight when they're 16, is they had the freedom to go choose a board, 
get some nails, not feel like anybody's going to yell at them, and, and, and enjoy it um, over the, you know, o- over that board. Um, you, you know, safety, uh, kids with safety, of course. When kids are integrated like this, we have found that homestead kids, when they're integrated like this, they actually grow up with a sense of, of safety. Um, we really, when we started with our apprentices, Daniel was only 14 when we got our, our, our first apprentice who was, you know, 18, 19 years old. So it made some interesting dynamics when, you know, when I was gone and Daniel, the 14 year olds was in charge, you know, of the 20 year old. Um, we had a couple 20 year olds say, this is just what I wanted. I wanted to do an apprenticeship where I was, you know, uh, bossed by a 14 year old. But the fact was that at 14, he had way more common sense, way more common sense. Uh, about you know backing up a tractor and, and positioning and and uh, those sorts of things, so um, so so it, it's only when they have freedom to get the get the pickup stuck, you know, um, and they learn that, that that there's limitations of machinery. It's when they learn how to pound the nail straight or crooked. When they learn how to do these things. Um, that's when they actually uh, take the ownership of it. Number four, let them invest in the homestead. Um, By this, I mean let them buy stuff that's theirs. Uh, One of the most critical things that happened to me growing up was when I turned about 17 or 18 and dad, uh, we had this discussion and he and I, I made the commitment that I wanted to stay on the farm and, and, and be there. From that day on, dad just <laughs> dropped his investment way down. Let me tell you what, it makes a big difference in how that 16-year-old drives the tractor if it's his tractor and not dad's tractor. Okay. And so uh, maybe it's not a tractor, maybe it's something else, maybe it's a four-wheeler, maybe it's an axe, maybe it's a chainsaw, maybe it's something. But the point is to let them, even as children, I mean, uh, um, e- even as a, as a six-year-old, they can have their own toolbox. And you can start with Christmas and birthdays, start filling that toolbox with a measuring tape and a hammer and pliers, and that's their toolbox. And 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 parent and it and, and and everybody knows it's it's their toolbox. Well, suddenly, guess what? Those tools don't get left out in the field. Those those tools, you know, and, and that's how you teach that is 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 allowing to invest in particular things with the farm. Number five, and this is this is related, but but it's it's a step it's a little step farther, and that is to encourage the children to have their own entrepreneurial business that is separate from the parents' business. Okay? So it makes a big difference if the child is out there showing visitors around the homestead and there's a herd of 10 cows and the child says, that calf right there is mine. The rest of them are dads or moms or whatever. Okay, There's a big difference between that and taking those guests out and saying, these tomatoes? This garden, this is my garden. Or these, my, these are my sheep. That was big for us in our family. I had my first chickens when I was 10. I got them from uh, Sears and Roebuck. Got uh, 50 heavy breed special as hatched, you know. They always say, heavy, you know, as hatched. Of course, there's always 18 pullets and 32 roosters. But anyway, <laughs> that's the way they come. <laughs> and, uh, and so I had these chickens well, Dad didn't know anything about chickens. You know, we had a milk cow, we had some beef cows and stuff. He didn't know anything about chickens. So I was a resident chicken expert. My older brother had rabbits. And um, so when our own kids came along, I said, well, you know, what, what, what do you want? And, and um, I, I think there's a, magic, there's a magic time age between about 8 and 10 that's the time to capture this. A child before 8 just really doesn't have an appreciation of money and it's hard to keep a, a ledger and a balance sheet and profit loss statement things like that but at eight they know about money all right they know what it is all right after about 10 or 11 
they tend to start being concerned about what other people think. And it's not cool anymore to, uh, to, to tout your business, okay? But between 8 and 10, we think is just the magic age to have enough understanding of capital and profit and loss and, and finances, but yet be tender-spirited enough to not be intimidated by saying, you know, this is, a, this is a dozen eggs I have. Would you like to buy a dozen eggs? But after about 11, 12, they start getting a little more self-conscious. We start going into that, that adult, um, uh, you know, peer dependency. And so, so um, when Daniel was eight, he started with his rabbits. And... Um, when Rachel was about six, girls are always ahead of boys anyway, um, she started with her, her um, she made, even when she was four and five, she, she's our little artist and uh, understands colors. And so she made these little um, loom things, you know, potholder things in a, in a loom and would sell them to customers. And, and uh, she made potpourri and she cut flowers and um, then she graduated to pound cakes and zucchini bread, and Daniel did his rabbits. And I mean, by the time he was 14, he was up to a thousand rabbits um, a year, you know, running a, a, a pretty significant business. And um, and so the, the the point is, they were not offshoots of what we were doing in, in the greater the greater farm business, homestead business. It it, it was their deal. Completely their deal. Somebody came and to see the rabbits. So, well, I got to go find Daniel. I can't show you the rabbits. I don't know anything about rabbits. Uh, I'll, I'll go get Daniel. And then Daniel march out there and show you my rabbits. You know, it wasn't a subset of what Dad and Mom were doing. Somebody came and wanted to see the potholders. Teresa didn't say, "Yeah, here I'll show." Them. No, no. Rachel, come show your potholders. There, there was. It, it's this. It's this ownership thing. Okay, and and we don't think that's that's greedy. We think that's that's really exercising entrepreneurial muscle you know, to, to bring that into adulthood. Um, so so uh, tapping into that window of opportunity, I think somewhere between 8 and 10, 8 and 11, 7 and a half and 11 uh, is, is really critical uh, for the kids. One of the things that I do at uh, homeschool conventions is I'll have a room of, you know, a couple hundred uh, people, and I just I just ask them to just brainstorm, tell me, if you have a child that's under 12, just yell it out so we hear it, what, what businesses do they have? And it's amazing the number of businesses. I mean, from, from lawn care to pet walking to pet washing to, uh, um, goodness, some, some rudimentary software stuff to social media to photography to, I mean, you, you can't imagine uh, the kinds of things that people do. So our little, I've got to tell this on our, our granddaughter, Lauren. So we have three grandchildren. Daniel and Sherry have, have three. They're 17, 15, and Lauren's 12. And so, of course, she's always trying to keep up with her brothers. And, um, and so the, the oldest one now has, um, uh, has ducks. And they picked enterprises that fit their personalities. He's a real, you know, uh, orange... Um, uh, Woo, you know, or anything goes, uh, ADD, and um, and so and ducks are kind of like that, you know, rock, 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 you know, spastic and all this. Uh, so he 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 sells duck eggs, and uh, he's getting I don't know what uh, you know eight dozen a day at eight bucks a day uh, times seven days a week is whatever it is five hundred six hundred bucks a week. That's not a bad little side project for an hour a day. Uh, for a 17-year-old, and then uh, Andrew has sheep, and he started with two bottle-fed lambs when he was about uh, nine, and, and he's, he's 15 now, and gradually built them up to a flock of about 50, sells the lambs. But several years ago, when the boys were starting with theirs, Lauren, of course, was behind, and she not to be outdone by her brother, she's just kicking around. I didn't even know that any of this was happening, but she was obviously, her head was spinning. Uh, what can I do? What can I do? She was about, you know, five. And, um, and so, so she hit upon an idea. We had an event at the farm, a tour, 
And so, uh, so she had on an idea. She went out in the fields and just gathered um, bouquets of wildflowers, brought them in. Next thing I knew here, she was in there with a customer. He was standing there uh, getting something there in the sales building. And she walks up to him. Now, again, you know, she's like five. And, um, and she walks up to him with this bouquet of flowers. And she said, uh, said I-, I picked these, and I'm sure that your wife would really like these flowers. <laughs> what was great was she already had the backup plan. Now, if you don't have a wife, I'm sure you know a lady who would like these <laughs> You know, she didn't know if he was married or not. You know, she wasn't that, she wasn't looking for wedding rings at that point. But, but, but she had her backup plan. If he didn't, wasn't married, you know, she knew he knew a, a lady somewhere that would like these flowers. She had her speech all set up. And, uh, and so, so it's, it's hard to appreciate what these self-owned, autonomous, entrepreneurial things can, can, uh, can do in the affirmation and, and the life of kids. So we're very pl- uh, pleased, Teresa and I are both very, very pleased that both of our kids, uh, when they hit 20 years old, and you know they're now 35 and 40, uh, but when they hit 20 years old, both of them had $20,000 in the bank in savings, and they never got a day of allowance. They'd earned it themselves. And uh, you know that's not a million dollars, but let me tell you, that's a pretty nice little nest egg and, um, and, and, and it was their money, their money, okay? That's an important thing. Let them spend it. We talk about give them freedom. If they earn it, it's their money. If they want to blow it on something stupid, great. Let them blow it on something stupid. Find out how unsatisfying something stupid is. It's better to learn that at nine than it is at 40, I remember well, Daniel was about uh, 10. He was down at the farm co-op and he was buying, a, buying rabbit feed. He was, a, he was a big buyer. Like I said, he had 1,000 rabbits. And, and uh, so he's buying rabbit feed by the ton, you know, and he, he counts his money out. He stands up, you know, his nose comes to the countertop here and he, he, uh, he says, I want a, want a half a ton of big red Southern States rabbit feed. And of course, the counter guy, he's enjoying this. He says, well, why don't you get a, why don't you get a ton? And uh, Daniel, he recounts his money. He says, well, I don't have enough money for, for a ton. I'll take a half a ton. And the counter guy winked at me. He said, yeah, how many adults haven't learned that lesson yet? <laughs> and so it's good to learn those lessons when you're, you know, when you're young um, and, and not when you're uh, older. So, so we're really big on the, the, the entrepreneurial and, and that golden time between about seven and a half and 11. Number six, keep a healthy sense of humor, including being willing to find entertainment and recreation, cheap recreational self-entertainment, recreation opportunities on the farm what that, or on the homestead. What that means is <clears throat> have a picnic area. Designate a picnic area. Do you have a little patch of woods? Do you have a little bend in the river? Do you have a little uh, spot out on the edge somewhere that you can make a fire pit and a, and a picnic table? Listen, you know, one of, the, one of the most important things on a homestead, there is a lot of work. And, and the work is never done, right? I mean, I mean it, if, you, if you say, I'll come in when I'm done, you'll never come in, right? And, and so the problem is, the, the, but, but kids, kids can't be push, 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 push all the time. One of the things I remember uh, so well about dad was sometimes we, we'd push, push, push on hay and we're trying to get to the barn, you know, uh, end of the day, the sun's going down. He just shuts off the tractor in the middle of the field, stops, says, let's watch the sun go down. Ten minutes, ten minutes. And I didn't ever realize how special that was until I started meeting other farmers and realized they never shut the tractor off. You know, it, 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 it's never time to just, to just you know, uh, uh, back up and just enjoy the surroundings. Listen to the frogs. Listen, I mean, on a homestead, we have, we have things that people in the city pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to experience. We're immersed in croaking frogs and jumping, uh, whatever, uh, grasshoppers and, and woolly worms and right, all sorts of cool stuff. You know, uh, salamanders in the edge of the creek. And we're building dams in the edge of the creek, uh, that sort of thing. Building forts. I mean, every homestead kid needs to have a little 
patch of trees that they can build a, a tree fort and a, you know have a tree house whatever in and so so having that sense of humor just to realize that that a lot of times you can get a lot more benefit out of occasional what I call commas in the workflow than designating a two-week vacation that you push, 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 push all year so you can take your two-week vacation. No. How about every two weeks, take a three-hour comma at the, at the fire pit and picnic table out by the river bend. You see what I'm saying? It, 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 that really makes a difference. Number seven, pay the children for their labor. Pay the children for their labor and make sure they understand that that income was generated from the homestead. Now I make a big differentiate. We never pay allowance. Right? Allowance is different. Uh, nobody should get paid for breathing. Okay. Now we make a big distinction between labor and chores. Okay. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Labor is stuff that they do that accrues value to the homestead. Chores, there, and I don't want to just say that chores aren't valuable. All I'm saying is that there, we want them to understand that there are things we do in life that you don't get compensated for. Uh, one of our big issues right now in our stewardship program at our farm is we're seeing, you know, we've been doing this for 25 years, and we've watched in 25 years the, 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 the personality, character, expectations of young people change a little bit. And one of the things that we've seen that's changed is the expectations that I don't do anything unless I get paid for it. Well, who gets paid for cleaning the toilet at your house? Who gets paid for doing the laundry at your house? Who gets paid for washing the dishes at your house? Who gets paid for making sure the inspection sticker is current on your car at your house? Okay. The fact is, the fact is, a lot of life, is it not, is, 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 is taken up by things we don't get paid for. All right. But if we didn't do them, it'd be a stinky, messy life. All right. And so we make a big distinction between between those kinds of things, make your bed, pick up your clothes, wash the clothes, uh, brush your teeth, all those, that stuff is, you do that because you're part of the human family and it makes living possible. But if they're out here doing work that actually accrues to the compensation of the homestead and takes pressure off of me, I'm going to pay them for that, okay? I'm going to pay them for that. And, and, uh, and, and so they grow up understanding this, this uh, the compensation, the, the difference in the compensation. Number eight, praise, praise, praise. And I'm going to be sexist here and single out the dads because this is more a dad problem. There are women, yes, that have this problem, but there are a lot more dads that have this problem because women are naturally nurturers and dads are naturally um, hard-hitting, uh, uh, go get it, okay? And so one of the greatest blessings of my life, I know, was my dad was a master woodworker. So before World War II, before he went off to World War II and flew in the Navy in uh, WWII, he was a journeyman pattern maker at a General Motors factory in Indiana. And back in those days, they made their, uh, their metal uh, molds. The initial thing was to make it out of wood. And so imagine, you know, making, making a, a wooden, um, like, mirror image carburetor because you poured it into the mold and I'm already over my skis on this but anyway these guys would come they would make their own tools so one of our greatest treasures is now in the in the sales building is his toolbox that he made with all of his tools that are in it you know calipers measuring devices gouges all you know they're all made out of like model t spring steel um and, and his meticulous stuff. He could make grandfather clocks, beds, furniture, meticulous. And then I came along. 
and I am, I, I'm, I'm completely function, no form whatsoever. I have no artistry in me at all, except when it comes to building compost piles and things like that. Um, but, but otherwise, when it comes to drawing, sculpting, uh, 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 you know, building things, I've always told Teresa, you know, every, every guy wants to build his gal a house. But I told her, sweetie, you don't want to live in a house I'd built for you. Uh, it would be like, you know, like uh, the house that Jack built that leaned into the wind. Um, but Dad was this meticulous woodworker, and I came along. I remember very well, you know, 15, 16, we needed a new corral gate. And so I took the initiative, got to build this corral gate. We got to sort cows. I'm tired of, you know, the not being able to control them, so I'm going to build a new corral gate. So I built this corral gate. And it was basically a parallelogram, you know, like it was probably 80, 80, 86 degree angles, you know. Um, put that thing on the hinges, and it swung. It worked. And I can only imagine today, you know, once you become a dad, you, you, you then there's a new context for things that you had growing up. And I can only imagine the the angst of his spirit as he walked by that corral and saw that parallelogram gate hanging there and bless his heart he came and he said great gate great gate and we dads especially you know how many times how many homes are there where if it's a job well done, there's no praise, but if there's a bent over nail or a crooked angle or something not right, that's what all the discussion's about. And if you don't know if you're what I call a fussy dad, ask your wife because she knows and lives with it and picks up the pieces and tries to massage the wounded emotions of the kids that come in who say, I tried, but it's never good enough. This is, this is basic stuff, folks. And if our kids are going to work with us, we have to figure out which hills we're going to die on. And there's a lot of hills that aren't worth dying on. And there's a lot of praise that hasn't been given and a lot of encouragement that hasn't been given. And I'm just thankful every day. My dad didn't complain at that 86 degree angle because a few years later I'm on the front page of Acres USA with chicken shelters and starting a revolution of pastured poultry nationwide. Would I have built chicken shelters? Would I have had the confidence to move forward with that if he had said, well, not a very straight gate? If we're going to work with the kids so they'll work with us, they have to know they have our unconditional affirmation and encouragement. <sighs> okay. Uh, to persevere. All right, number eight. Uh, the eight was praise your children. I'm almost done. Number nine. Number nine. Enjoy the homestead yourself. I can't believe how many farmers and homesteaders complain about their own place. The cows are always out. The pigs are always out. The beans have weeds in them. Oh, we got fungus in the apple trees. Oh, all the, you know, the wood got moldy or whatever. I mean, right? It's, I get it. I get it. We're hardwired to complain and not encourage. We are. I mean, whoever comes back from town and says, and, and, and your wife says, you know, how did, how did it go in town? Oh, honey, I hit six go lights. We don't call them go lights. We call them stop lights because we remember what makes us stop, not what makes us go, right? So we're hardwired for the negative and not the positive. We, we have to work, don't we, at, at, at positive. And so, and so, yeah, when, you know, when things are down. But, but listen, when kids grow up hearing constant negative speech, if all they hear is, ain't no money in farming. Man, I wish we'd have 
done this different. I wish we'd have done rah, 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 rah. Boy, that sure makes them want to work with you, doesn't it? Everybody wants to work with a sourpuss. I mean, man, sourpuss just, just that's what attracts people. No, 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 no. No. You, you, Keep your vision out there in front. I know you're going to have a bad day. There's going to be a blizzard. The cows are going to be out. The well's going to go dry. The roof's going to fall off the house, whatever it is, okay? But keep your chin up. Keep your, what'd you do this for? You know, have your mission statement. Everybody should write their mission statement. It should be a one sentence mission statement. Ours is our mission is to develop. Emotionally, economically, and environmentally enhancing agricultural prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. I've got it on my desk. We have it on our information. Our, 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 all of our uh, branding, our bags say, um, healing the landscape one bite at a, uh, yeah, healing the land one bite at a time. That's our, that's our uh, mantra. Listen, if your vision is sacred and it's righteous and it's noble, post it on the, Put it on the blackboard, put it on the refrigerator, put it in your, your kid's lunchbox. Um, you know, uh, uh, keep that vision because where there's no vision, the people perish. And so, and so sure, you're going to have a bad day. Things are not going to go right. But as long as we have that vision out there and it's definite and it's in our, it's in our faces, it'll help us to stay where we're supposed to be. And finally, number 10. Number 10 is to back off and let the kids take responsibility, take reins, take charge, take, take authority. Let them have their pet projects. Um, you know, one of the, one of the greatest joys uh, for us was, you know, my dad passed away very young. He was only 66. That seems really young now to me. And uh, I was only 31. But one, the, the thing that, that made him happiest, he was an accountant by trade, never a CPA, but, but did you know, accounting, tax work, and bookkeeping for a lot of small businesses and farmers in the area. And his greatest joy was in teaching a son or daughter, deviously, especially the daughter in an Amish household, did a lot of Amish accounting. So he, he was always teaching the daughters in an Amish household about the money. So the dad would have to come to the daughter and ask permission, can I buy something? That was his kind of little devious way of, of working some, some, uh, some, some woman power into Amish families. Anyway, um, his greatest joy was in, in empowering people with the confidence and the savvy to be able to, um, to not depend on him as much. And, and pretty soon, uh, their tax work, you know, dropped from, well, last year you charged us for 10 hours, this year you're going to charge us five hours. He loved that. He didn't see that as lose, losing business. He saw that as empowering people. And he brought that, he did that in our family as well. And so one of our joys was, although he died uh, very, very young, uh, as far as the community was concerned and our farm business was concerned, there was not a bobble, not a dip. And my greatest blessing now is I know I could drop dead in the last, next one minute of a heart attack and Polyface wouldn't have a, a, a bobble because Daniel's in charge of day-to-day -day operations. So, so the parents so often, you know, the older generation, man, I mean, they, they think they're going to take the tractor to the grave and the cow to the grave and the tomato to the grave. And, and you know, you're not. You're not. So you might as well transfer it early. Early you transfer it the more the track record of, of, of dependability and accountability can be established so that when you finally kick the bucket, uh, you know, you, it, it's well established and you don't have to sit there and worry uh, about what's going to happen in the future. So, so, so letting those kids uh, have their innovations, um, you know, one of the, one of the most uh, emotionally charged things that I get, I, I do succession succession seminars, and there's you know somebody in the, in the in the group, and and uh, you know a, a 35 year old uh, son or daughter, and you got big tears rolling down their cheeks and saying, how do I how do I get dad to let me try something? That's 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 a, that's tragic. That's tragic that a 35-year-old doesn't have enough freedom to try something. 
And so, you know, the older generation tends to think the younger generation is going to blow it all. And the young generation thinks the older generation doesn't trust them with anything. I get that. that, that that's, that's, that's family. That's, you know, that, that's human experience, okay? What we got to do is we got to carve out safe places where those freedoms can be exercised. Maybe it's, all right, well, you take this five acres and see what you want to do with it. Or you take this herd, you do what you want to do with it. You take this garden spot, you do what you want to do with it. We've got to create, you, you take this enterprise, do what you want to do with it. And, and, and so you create places of, of failure and freedom that don't jeopardize the whole homestead, the whole, you know, mothership, those kinds of things. So uh, freedom is a, is a big deal, letting the kids uh, enjoy their freedom. So those are, those are my 10 kind of 10 rules for how we work with our kids so they will love to work with us. Questions? Uh, are there questions from the streaming audience? Qu uh, how do we move into this section now? We got about, what do we got, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes for questions? Um, Amy? Okay, sorry. Amy, I'm going to the sky. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, um, there's, there is work that they can help you with, and there, is, there are things that you can do that they can just be with you, okay? Um, let me give you an example. So, when our son Daniel was in diapers, I'd take him to... Uh, I, was, I was actually um, uh, uh, putting in a new boundary fence, uh, digging, putting in a new fence. So I'm digging post holes. Well, he's, you know, he's in diapers. He can't dig a post hole. But I would take, you know, a couple little, you know, Tonka trucks, you know, some little things that he could play around. So he'd sit there and he'd, you know, play in the dirt and I'd dig the post holes. And one of the things that, that I did to pace myself was I would only take a drink of water every third hole. That would incentivize me to, you know, to not sit and fool around and, and work hard to get three holes done. I'll get another drink of water. Three holes, get another drink of water, okay? Going along. And I'm, I'm doing it, you know, by hand with a post hole digger. I have a PhD degree, post hole digger degree. And uh, so, so you, know, um, you know, we would do this. Well, then he's about seven years old. Let's move fast forward a few years. Seven years old and... Um, and he and the little neighbor boy get to be good friends, and they're going to go build a, build a fort. You know, every, every seven-year-old boy wants to go build a fort. So they decided to do it over at his place, the neighbor's place. So, you know, Teresa takes Daniel over there. And about 45 minutes later, the phone rings, and it's the, it's the neighbor boy's mother. And she's calling us saying, what is it with your son? He won't let mine take a drink until they finish the east wall of the fort. <laughs> so so don't, don't downplay simply their presence with you what they're taking in what they're learning because back then when he was playing around dirty you know little kids whining oh i'm thirsty daddy we're not going to get a drink till i finish my third post hole that i didn't say that was some sort of a cultish rule but he got the point that he transferred then later later in life and so just their presence don't feel like you've got to you've got to involve them or babysit them but just their presence, they're, they're catching stuff. And don't underestimate what they're catching. They catch way more than they, when we teach. What more is caught than taught? And so that's why I'm, I'm just such a believer in the time. Time is important. And sometimes their little hands can come in and help, and you can steer them. They can, they can you know, uh, you're gathering eggs. You can gather all the eggs. Take a little extra, extra uh, little bucket for them with some extra little maybe hay in the bottom as a, and let them gather, you know, three boxes while you gather the other 20 uh, type of thing. But, but um, you know, we're, at that point, we're not in a hurry. We just don't want to break eggs. 
And so, so the, the lessons will be appropriate to the age. When they learn to put them in without breaking them, then, then they can go a little bit faster. And, and, and eventually, you can turn the whole egg enterprise over to them, and it, it can move from, uh, from something that you're doing, tell them, you take over the chickens, and we'll pay you five bucks a dozen to do the chickens. Now suddenly, they have ownership. And you've gotten away from, you, you, you can go do something else. And this is when they're, you know, eight, nine years old, old enough to understand. And you've turned that responsibility over to them. But it starts with simply presence. Just being present. I don't know if it answered the question, but I hope so. Another question? Uh, yeah, we have more. Okay, so the next question is from Nancy. And she says, how do you keep your young teens engaged? When the fun of the farm is over and it really is chores. Okay, this is, this is why you have to start early. And you have to have your lifestyle. This is, this is not just a business, it's lifestyle. And so, we don't have a TV. We never had a TV, still don't have a TV. Our kids grew up with no TV. Okay, we, we never bought toys for them. Toys were, while Teresa's watching, washing dishes, they can play in the kitchen cupboards and pull out all the Tupperware. What's more enjoyable for a toddler than Tupperware? All different sizes, different colors, bright shade, you know, all this stuff. Uh, and, and so, again, it's presence, it's not P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, but P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, presence, okay? Uh, and so, so for, your, for your older teens, um, do they have enterprises that they're interested in or that they can do? And, 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 and um, so one of the issues is reducing the distractions. Our grandkids are 17, 15, and 12, soon to be 13. They still don't have smartphones. You say, that's mean parents. No, that's focused kids. Okay? So, so there, are, there has never been a time in human history when youth have had more distractive opportunities than today. And so if you can't, if you can't find joy in, in a s'mores cookout, by the creek or in a stack of firewood beautifully stacked or a cleaned up patch of fence line newly ordered away from multiflora rose and autumn olive um, it, it, those kinds of things there is beauty there is beauty function and sacredness and nobility in in everything we do on the homestead if it's done well and if it's done right and I think our biggest problem is that we, we want a homestead, but we want to do all the things that our cousins and friends are doing too. And I'm here to tell you, you can't do it. You can't do it. Because if you do, you're going to lose your kids. And, you're, and you, have to, you have to dedicate yourself to, um, to creating enthusiastic, sacred, noble things and, 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 and speak of the importance of organic matter, earthworms, nutrient-dense food, health. Feed your kids a diet of sacredness in their work so they'll understand the big picture. It's not drudgery unless you make it drudgery. Drudgery is only drudgery if you don't have enough creativity and, and, and storytelling uh, uh, ability to to create the why you know uh, Simon Sinek who wrote the book start with why he talks a lot about this he says all of us like to talk about what we do some of us talk about how we do it but what everybody wants to know is why you do it and that's the one thing we don't talk about and so they need to hear that at the dinner table they need to see the mission statement posted in their rooms on the bathroom mirror they need to hear the why because that is what will fire the imagination and affirmation 
of youth. Next question. Uh, you know, I, th I think that I think that depends. That's a great question. I think it, a little bit of it, it depends on on what the enterprise is. Um, so, so I'll, I'll take Daniel's rabbits for an example. So, when he started with his rabbits, um, you know, he ran it through. It, it was completely his. Of course, he sold the rabbits through Polyface because that was our umbrella, you know, deal. But it was strictly a flow through. All the income went to him. He bought the feed. Everything. It was. It was simply a. Um, uh, it's not a slush fund. It's a. It's a flow through. It's just a. It's just a flow through category. Um, now those rabbits are are part of the Polyface umbrella thing because why? Because much of the work is done by apprentices. It's done by you know other other uh, thing people that he mentors in. And so it's now one of our, you know, just one of our enterprises. Um, and so I, I think that's the kind of thing where simply the maturity, the maturity of the child and the maturity of the enterprise, you'll, under, you'll know a time when it, when it, when it tips over into, into being incorporated into the larger homestead as part of its marketing strategy or if it, if it retains its, um, its distinctive uh, you know, physiology within the homestead as an independent uh, enterprise. I, I think that's something that you'll, the maturity will, will work itself out. All right. Um, we're only going to take a couple more. This one's from Mike, and he says, as a family that has spent their entire life in the feast, and we're now transitioning to a rural life, do you have, have to make the transition? Suggestions for the transition. Um, he doesn't say how old his children are, but I, um, all the principles that I shared here are applicable no matter how, hard, how old the kids are. I will tell you that the older the children are, children are, the harder it is to salvage them into this. That would be one kind of big principle. Um, but number two, it'll be incumbent upon you to... Uh, to fire up their imagination with the why of, of what you're doing and, um, and, and with alternative, with alternative enthusiastic things to do, uh, to realize, look, um, you know, watching the miracle of a plant grow, make blossoms, and, and, and then a juicy tomato running down your arm Man, if that doesn't satisfy as much as being the points getter on Angry Birds, I don't know what will. Uh, and so, so I think it's incumbent on, um, on the parents to create boundaries of distraction. And then, and then that's one. And on the other hand, to create, um, to create a, a firming, incentivizing places on now the homestead to to create enthusiasm and and uh, um, whatever personal uh, satisfaction uh, for the kids and and that that takes it'll take some effort but but I've seen it done many many times and if it's done well the kids will be thrilled that they left the city but but you have to leave the city you have to leave the city. You can't be, you can't be sitting there, mom and dad, uh, um, complaining about, oh, oh, I wish we could get Papa John's delivery out here. You know, <laughs> one, one statement like that, and you've just you know, destroyed two months' worth of your work with your kids. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you, you, have, to, you, have, to, you have to be committed, and you have to, you have to be converted yourself. And, and then you can pass that conversion on. And you got to sometimes getting the city out of the parents takes a lot more work. We, we see this all the time with our customers. You know, we want to come and see that. We want to come and see the processing. No, they don't. Their kids want to. 
Parents are calling for their kids. Parents sit in the car and the kids, the eight, seven, eight years old kids run around and they, they want to see the chickens butchered and see the guts and all that stuff. They love that. Mom and dad are going over there retching and I can't stand it. You know. they, don't want to, they don't want to see this. But the kids, the kids are fine with it and, and, and they think it's just, it's just fantastic. So, uh, so I, I think a lot of times it's this, it's, it's, um, we, we've, lost, we've lost a generation here, maybe two generations in this whole, um, you know, uh, uh, abdication of visceral, ecological, umbilical, participatory massage. That was a lot of words strung together. <laughs> but uh, but I, I put a word picture that, that, that we are now a couple of generations removed from the kind of visceral participation that you see in Little House on the Prairie or, you know, uh, Walt, uh, Walt um, the Waltons, yeah. Um, you know, those kinds of things where people, uh, you know, we're, we're close, you know, we're close to nature. All right, another question. To not be afraid of chickens. Uh, well, the first thing is that if you have a rooster who is an aggressive, kind of an a, a aggressive attacker, um, kill him. <laughs> so the kids know that you're going to protect them and you're not going to get them in a compromised situation. We had one named Little John. I watched him hit Rachel one time. She was going out to gather eggs. She was about six. And uh, Little John was in the soup pot in 24 hours. Um, that's a confidence builder in kids. Their trust in you that you're not going to put them in a dangerous, compromised situation. Um, so if you've got aggressive chickens, uh, you know, um, do that. So that, that, that's number one. Number two is nestle them into you. I mean, if they are scared, hold them tight. Don't just put them down and, and have the chickens come peck on their toes. All right? That's scary. Uh, if they've got, if they're, if they're already frightened a little bit, so hold them up. Don't, don't drop. Don't put them in a situation where, um, where their fears can be, um, whatever, bolstered. You know, uh, uh, affirmed. Um, and 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 gradually, if you hold them and you gather the eggs and you pick up a chicken and and it's a nice docile chicken and they pet their feathers and you. This is all, you know, inoculation gently. You, 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 uh, you embryo this in just a little bit at a time. You meter it out. But, but mainly I would suggest that you, you know, you, you protect them from, from being placed too quickly into a situation. We see this with a lot of urban visitors with children. Uh, they have no idea what it means to be gentle around animals. You know, you, you see them they're moving fast and, 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 and it frightens things. And a lot of times children are like that. It takes a long time for a child to learn how to, how to dance with an animal where the animal doesn't feel threatened and the, and the person then um, doesn't feel then, uh, you know, whatever, uh, uh, taken aback by the, by the sudden, you know, movement of, of the animal. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's a dance and it, it takes time to do, but main thing I would say is just make sure your child is, is secure, feel safe and, uh, and expose them gently over time and, um, uh, be patient, be patient. Thankful for the little steps. Right. Great. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Right, Does anybody have a have a question here? We, yes. Age appropriate. How do you gauge what you pay? 
because yeah, it, it, it's totally age appropriate. Yeah, I mean, goodness, um, you know, I mean, un unless yeah, yeah, it's age appropriate. So goodness, uh, you know, for a, for a six year old, a buck or two, pretty big deal. Uh, but you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do. I mean, like like um, uh, I'll pay you. A, a nickel, a nickel for every thistle you chop, for example. Um, and you got to have an honest child to do that. Uh, 